You are now listening to the Minority Trailblazer Podcast. Let the story begin. One time for the lovers, two times for the ladies, three times for the brothers, four times for the babies. Do you love her? 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 One time for the lovers, two times for the ladies, three times for the brothers, four times for the babies. Do you love her? 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 Brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. Brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. She my brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. She my brown skin, love a brown skin. Hold me down. Yeah. I know what it troubles nation. It's been over a year. You've been waiting. You've been emailing. You've been calling. You've been texting. You've been asking. Hey, Mr. Greg, tell me where you been. You've been searching, you've been asking, you've been wondering why. Hey, see, if y'all ain't know what Lil Wayne fans, y'all don't know what it is. That's that Miss Carter background. But yo, what's up, man? My daughter's trouble is a nation, yo. Y'all make some noise. I'm excited to be live and direct and back with you, my family, my people, to bring to you, to bring to you season set. I, I can really cry right now. Like, I'm getting emotional right now. It took a year, year off and getting recharged, refocused. And yo. I got 40 episodes hot and ready for y'all. We've been in the lab. We, I done, I done risked my life for this. Like seriously, I'm in Miami. Yup. Los Angeles. Yup. Uh, where else we go? Where else we go? Oh, Boston. Yup. Like we've been, oh, Houston, Texas. Yup. To get live. Oh, Charlotte. Durham. I mean, get to get live interviews. We got the video this season, right? <laughs> we got monsters this season, right? <laughs> and if this is a round reminder, reminder, remind you, don't you quit. Six and a half, oh dang, there's seven years in this game. We still coming with fire. Consistency, consistency. My life changed this year. Why? Because 15 years of hard work finally getting to fruition. My support system, my brotherhood. Shout out to my brother Mike Farrell. Shout out to my boy Cindy Evans. Shout out to Charles Jones. Shout out to Whoa Imogen. Shout out to so many people that made this journey, this reality. Shout out to all y'all that prayed for the boy. Kept me uplifted and whatnot. Didn't write a song, man. Like, we here, we back now, and we delivering number classics this season nothing but classics this season y'all get excited in 2021 if god let us see it we got more in store man like I, y'all don't y'all, man y'all don't know how excited i am about the season man like so it really is um i got i really want to over the next couple of weeks i'm going to release a brotherhood podcast i'm gonna have a couple of brothers that uh really mean a lot to me on this show and we're gonna kind of break down where we've been right but I want to introduce y'all before we went. I, I didn't want my voice in, to be the only voice that y'all hear, the first voice that y'all hear in regards to interview style. Now, we're going to jump in and give you a little snippet of the flavor that we've been cooking over the last couple months. And then we're going to jump in and just unpack what we've been up to, where we've been, what's life been like over the last year and a half, and uh, intermission for the show. And yeah, we're going to get started. So, yo, remember, remember, if you knew this podcast, yo, Go listen to the last hundred episodes. If you if you familiar with this show, hey, you got forty hot and ready coming your way, right? So now we're gonna make way to introduce our first few sponsors. Yep, I said it. Sponsors of the Minority Trouble as a podcast ever, ever, E V E R ever, and they two black owned businesses, black owned brands. That's what we do, all right? So yo, Minority Trouble Nation, thank y'all so much. I love you. I, I, I for real, I love you. We got. Merch on the way. We got classes on the way. We got lives on the way. We got so much on the way. We got other, ooh, I can't even tell you. But I love y'all. Y'all keep rocking with me. I'm going to keep rocking with y'all, all right? So, yeah, yeah, let's uh, let's roll them sponsorships. Before we jump into things, man, I want to introduce our lead sponsor for the entire Minority Troublemaker podcast season seven, Rec Div, right? So, Rec Div is the first online job board created specifically for historically black colleges and universities. It connects employers with qualified candidates from HBCUs across the country and gives students access to internships, career tips, and resources they need to succeed in this tough economy. Employers can post jobs for free and candidates can apply in seconds. Like imagine Indeed, but for only historically black colleges and universities, those students. So employers and candidates 
they're looking for jobs, etc. You can visit recdiv.com today to get started. Once again, you can visit recdiv.com. That's R E C D I V.com today and get started. And, um, the biggest thing is, well, D Griggs, he's been on the podcast before. He's actually the owner of ATX Web Designs, which as you'll see over the course of the season, they're going to do our website. So it's almost done. My notice is dot com. It's almost ready for y'all. And it's an, a plethora of other things that we are in the works to do. It'll be all done by our technology partner, which is ATX Web Designs. All right. Oh, y'all thought I was done. We ain't done. We ain't done. We are also sponsored this season for the first few episodes by the Scotch Porter brand. And you already know holiday seasons are among us. So if you are looking for any beard, hair, face care, grooming products, I'm here to tell you Scotch Porter is the real deal. And right now, if you go online, they got a 50% off collection sale that just kicked off and is the perfect, I repeat, the perfect time to stock up on your self-care essentials. So if you struggle with anything with like itchiness, dryness, shedding, When it comes to your beard, your hair, or your face, or if you have black blemishes or bacteria or clogged pores, yo, Scotch Porter is the brand for you. This product is perfect solution for all that, right? It's non-toxic and it includes ingredients like kale, protein, white willow bark, biotin, pomegranate enzymes to cleanse, condition, moisturize, and promote growth. And once again, like I'm telling you, perfect holiday gift and for a limited time you got 50 percent off all the collections just go to scotchporter.com it'll show you all that stuff they got a plethora of different options and i'm telling you i use it so any of the good pics that you see online on instagram when their hair is popping that's via scotch porter right and make sure you show them some love to let you know yo i found out about your product listening to the minority troubles podcast blow up their instagram or their twitter whatever platform you on. make sure you let them know that you appreciate them sponsoring and giving you this content right content for free that you get to listen to and get uplifted with all right <laughs> so once again thank you for listening to us we back to our regular scheduled programming welcome to the minority trailblazer podcast and i'm your host greg e hill the culture change agent on this show we interview young successful minorities in a variety of fields to educate empower and inspire our current and future generational leaders and today i got an all-time show for you today man like it's, it's been a marathon i'm doing seven episodes today um in the history of the minority trouble is a podcast and we like 120 episodes deep right now I've never done this many episodes in a day, right? All this outfit change. You know me. I'm really a hoodie guy. I'm doing, I'm changing outfits and all that stuff, man. But I'm particularly excited about this show because I have somebody that I've been trying to get on the show for like 10 years. And the day, the day came and like the devil tried to work and tried not to make it happen. We made it happen. I'm excited to share a story on the show. Um, and I'm going to read a snippet, a snippet, a snippet of a bio, and then we're going to jump right into it. So. <clears throat> She is an artist who drew national attention in 2015 when she climbed the flagpole in front of South Carolina Capitol building and lowered the Confederate battle flag. The flag was originally raised in 1961 as a statement of opposition to the civil rights movement and lunch counter sit-ins occurring at the time. The massacre of nine black parishioners by a white supremacist at Emanuel AME Zion Church in Charleston reignited controversy over South Carolina's flag. Her act of defiance against the symbol of hate has been memorialized in photos and artwork and has become a symbol of resistance and empowerment of women across the country. Activism is one of the trio pursuits that have driven her since a young age, when she showed talent as both a musician and a writer, particularly a writer of plays and films. Her roots as an artist and activist were planted early. Her father, who has served as the dean of the Howard University School of Divinity and the president of both Shaw University and the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, is a nationally recognized scholar of African-American religious history and, and how it has impacted social justice movements across the country. Her mother spent her career as an educator addressing the achievement gap and disparities of education. Her interest in the arts was fostered early in her life and she has showed promise even then. At the age of seven, she learned to play the piano and wrote her first piece of music. Two years later, she wrote her first play. And at the age of 18, she won a $40,000 scholarship from the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences as a part of short film competition. She studied film at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. In her senior year short film, Wake, won numerous accolades and was a finalist for the prestigious 
Wasserman Award. Hopefully I said it right. Whose past recipients include Spike Lee. In 2011, while an artist in residence at Sachi and Sachi in New York, she marched with Occupy Wall Street. And much of her activism has focused upon incidents, incidents of young black people being unjustly killed and issues related to structural racism. She traveled with a group of youth activists from North Carolina to Florida during the Dream Defenders occupation of the State House as a protest against the killing of Trayvon Martin. She also participated in the 11 mile march in front of Beaver Creek, Ohio Walmart, where John Crawford was killed by police, where John Crawford was killed by police to the courthouse in Zenia, Ohio, demanding release of the footage showing the killing. And then from 2013 to 2015, she served as the Western Field Organizer for Ignite North Carolina, where she is one of the founders of the tribe, a grassroots organization collective a grassroots organizing collective. The trial was created in the aftermath of the 2014 uprising in Ferguson to address similar issues of structural racism and police violence confronting the community of Charlotte, North Carolina. During the 2016 Charlotte uprising, she helped organize protests and community meetings. She continues to organize at the grassroots level, and that is key, in Charlotte, focusing on developing models for sustainable community organization. And her dedication to her community work has not lessened her interest in either film or music. She often interweaves the two. And in 2016, she wrote and produced and directed a performance piece, Rise Up and Go, Monticello Summit, a four-day public summit on the legacy of slavery and freedom in America held at the sites of Thomas Jefferson's former plantation. The celebration was a collaboration between Thomas Jefferson Foundation and the National Endowment for the Human Humanities in the University of Virginia. And her awards are numerous and include the Maryland Distinguished Scholars for Voice, the National Board of Review Student Film Award, and the 2016 NAACP Image Award. She has been named to the Route 100 and Ebony 100 in recognition of her work in behalf of civil rights, and she currently lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, where she, where she continues her work as an artist and grassroots community organizer. So my noted Trailblazer Nation, um, I know you saw these sweeping B-roll images of powerful moments and all this excitement, awards, gala, but I'm really encouraged and excited for her out of her own mouth and for us to engage in a real story around um, our guest and really talk about some current topics, talk about future topics and really just build and grow. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Miss Bree Newsom Bass to the Minority Trouble as a podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yo, so I'm, I'm really, really excited because one, uh, two ways, one, because this conversation that we're about to have is all it's, it's never been more urgent to really discuss and unpack a lot of things that's in society. And most importantly, from our platform, there's no agenda. There's no agenda with this. We're just having a great conversation. I'm not trying to paint a picture of something that's not there or I'm not trying to create something. And I think that's really important, specifically with responsible journalism Um, in my lane. Right. In my lane is a, is a podcast guy. My name is to, 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 to intact vulnerability. But most importantly, just have the artist and creative um, attack the story in their own lens. Like I'm really about cr crafting your own narrative because you know the media they can they can craft the narrative easily more than ever now. And unfortunately, even us as a culture, a subculture or a culture rather, we can draft up our own narrative and we can be shared online and have all these pieces and people take it as fact. And it's like yo, this is so far from it. So I'm 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 excited to come to the oracle, the source to a certain degree, right? So before we jump into the show, I we like to start the show off with a quote. So so Bree, can you take us through? Um, a quote or a mantra that you live by and then share with us a story about how you apply that quote to your everyday life. Yes. Um, Psalm 27. I love the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Um, and I mean, really the whole Psalm I will, I will meditate on again and again. Um, cause this just to me is like a complete prayer. I mean, it talks about, you know, God being your protection, um, talking about how the, the primary thing to pursue in life is to, you know, that, that oneness with God, right? And that, that's just how I choose to operate. Um, which is, you know, I already know what I want for my life, right? But what's more, what's most important for me is that I live the life that God has called me to live. Because when I do that, things work out best for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. another quote I heard that's real funny is like, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't ever predict tomorrow. So, um, so that's really how I, that's really how I try to live day by day. Ooh, and I almost forgot to mention a limited edition, yeah, Brie, a limited edition talk show powered by Advanced Carolina executively produced by natalie bullock brown featuring the brie newsome bass and 
Ajamu Dillahunt as the co-host. And it's called When They See Us Vote. It's a project that myself and Minority Troubles in Media has been working with with Advanced Carolina. Shout out to Marcus Bass, as well as a host of others. Shout out to Renee, Charles Jones, Sydney Evans, Michael Farrell, and the whole team in producing this series, which talks about the intersection of voting from a variety of different perspectives. I'm talking about um, how you can engage, how you can educate on a lot of topics that lead us to vote, but also a lot, a lot of topics that hold us back from voting. So go to when they see us vote.com for more information. This is something, a work of art rather that Bree Newsom Bass and Ajamu have really put together, man. So check it out. It's on YouTube as well. Um, and yeah, I had to mention that series. Mm, so tell us. So, so, so let's, let's, uh, let's go to last week, right? I always, I have this segment before I talk about find the post. Cause I always want to make sure I kind of get an energy of where the interview is at. You feel me? Because I mean, I've been on podcasts, unfortunately, where I come in out off the gate crazy, boom, boom, boom. And then they're like, yo, they had somebody pass in the family. So I need to, I had to redirect my energy to make sure that not to say I, I had to lower it, but I wanted to be respectful in kind of the way I approach things, right? Um, specifically with certain individuals. So, um, let's go to last week. Can you share with us a moment, good or bad last week that you learned something from and share with the audience what you learned? You know, last week, I feel, was uh, very focused on the passing of John Lewis, right? Mm. Um, and just kind of like the ongoing like funeral processions around him, a lot mm-hmm. of reflecting on his life and legacy, um, kind of reflecting on where we are today. Um, and, you know, in terms of like the ongoing struggles mm-hmm. um, against racism. Um, and so that is something that I have been reflecting on quite a bit. I mean, and it is it's it's good and bad, right? Because in John Lewis, I see someone who lived to be 80. You know, a lot of people from the civil rights movement did not live mm-hmm. uh, a, a full life. They they were cut down, like, in that struggle. So that in and of itself is a celebration. Um, at the same time, I see still a lot of attempts to kind of, like, co-opt the aims of the civil rights movement, particularly um, the aims of Martin Luther King Jr., right? You see that that happening a lot where, where people um, really kind of try to distort um, the message of nonviolence mm-hmm. and, um, you know, Martin Luther King really operated with an anti-war message. And I don't know if you watched the, the, um, funeral, but, um, Bill Clinton's message in particular, you know, really <laughs> kind of like, really kind of like sparked some controversy because he was up there trying to like almost pit, uh, black revolutionaries against each other, trying mm-hmm. to frame, you know, uh, John Lewis is like the acceptable, mm-hmm. uh, you know, black revolutionary, whereas Stokely Carmichael, I'm sorry, Kwame Ture. Uh, you know, was not. And so it's just, again, you know, it, it, good and bad. Like, mm-hmm. it's beautiful. And at the same time, it's like this reminder that we are still very much like in this struggle. We are still constantly having to <clears throat> fight against historical revisionism and erasure. I mean, I've had to do that just in the past five years, like in the aftermath of taking down the flag in South Carolina. I've dealt with people trying to like rewrite the narrative around that and what happened, you know. Um So, yeah, so that that. That has really kind of been on my mind, especially last week. Mm. So let's let's jump right in. Before we go to the origin story, I, I want to approach this interview a tad differently. Um, can you discuss, uh, because the act of you taking down the flag, right? And there's this, that was, that was huge. Um, and Pat, did you realize it was going to be that significant? And do you realize that it was going to change your life in the way that it has? Yes and no. I mean, I we knew how significant it was just because there was so much attention focused on that flag at the time, right? Like, like the the world was focused on the flag in South Carolina, um, and just the controversy over South Carolina continuing to fly that flag in in the aftermath of everything that had happened. So I knew at the time that I was taking it down, it was probably going to change my life. <clears throat> that said. There's only so many ways that you can predict, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh-huh. um, how that will play out. And so, you know, the farther we get away from that event, um, the less predictable it becomes in terms of some of the dynamics that, that I've had to deal with. I mean, quite frankly, I really went into it trying to prepare for the worst case scenario. You know, like I get hurt, I get killed, like, you know, worst case scenario. That's what I was most prepared for. Um, And so kind of dealing with the aftermath of it being successful, dealing with, you know, fame and attention and just like a lot of weird dynamics that can come with that. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't always predict those types of things. That's something that I've had to navigate. But that's also why I say, like, my mantra is like living day by day Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it has been like a very day by day 
trying to make sure I stay centered, trying mm-hmm. to make sure I stay focused on, you know, what God's mission is for me in life. Yeah, but how, because how, I mean, I, I know it's day by day, but I know you're really, because I mean, I ain't gonna lie, like when Bass, uh, your, your, your husband and my line brother, when he said, okay, Brie, I was like, okay, cool, cool. And I was like, oh, she's an activist. I'm like, okay, cool. And he let me know what you did. And you mean, I'm, I'm always in, <sighs> when you talk about activists and pieces, I'm always like, okay, is she really like, for real, for real, like in the streets with it? Like, because you know, we do live in a culture where now it's become very, very cool to be activists, right? Um, there's a lot of corporate connections with certain things and there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes on with, with really being in the front as opposed to maybe back in the day. Right. So as you, as you, did you, were you really prepared or how, how has it been kind of the transition? Because you're still, and luckily one thing I can say, I lived in, I see it. You, you've always been on the front lines. You never, you never left. You never said, okay, cool. Well now I can go on all these little corporate boards and do all this talk, other talk and let the people do the work. That's one thing I always admire about yourself and Bass and so many and a few others, not so many others that really stayed true. But I mean, if I know we jump in the gun, but what is it like though to really in this era right now where I mean, it's, it's, it's this, it's a very, a weird place where especially corporate companies and, and, and entities are interconnected. So now you're doing this stuff on a major scheme and now people want to say, hey, everybody want a piece to have you speak on this platform and stuff that you may not want to leave. How do you kind of gauge where you give your energy to? And then also to, um, and I like to ask two questions at once. I'm a, I'm, I'm not technical. My interviews are just, that's my spirit, but also too, how have you, um, how have you grown over the last five years in regards to, um, your energy consumption? Yeah. So. One thing is I am always conscious of co-optation, right? That, I mean, that happens a lot. And what's co-optation? Uh, like break it down for us. Yeah. Co-optation is where you have kind of like the corporate entities, the politicians. Um, I mean, I use the term establishment. Yeah. And when I say establishment, I mean like the status quo, like mm-hmm. the people who benefit from preserving things as they are. Mm-hmm. Um, wealth inequality, racial inequality, um, you have some people who are very explicit and that that's what they want to maintain. Right. And then you have other people who will pretend mm-hmm. <laughs> to support justice because that's the thing to do. Right. Like now it's the thing to say Black Lives Matter. It's the thing to, you know, have put out your corporate statement. I'll give you a perfect example. Mm-hmm. Um, a corporation who posts a statement about Black Lives Matter. But if you talk to the the minority employees at their company, they'll tell you what's really going on behind the scenes. Right. Yeah. That that's the kind of dynamics that we're talking about, right? The politicians who will get out and, and march with you at the protest, but then as soon as they're back in their office, they're passing policies that are killing us. That's the kind of stuff that we have to constantly guard against. Um, and I have had to guard against that, especially since, you know, gaining the attention after taking the flag down, because then I kind of became like a symbol. Yeah. And, you know, I... And I would definitely have people trying to figure out, like, you know, well, you put your name on this. They don't want to actually engage me like in a genuine, you know, kind of conversation or or really try to find out, like, you know, what what do you think should happen? They just want to put my name on something because then they can say, oh, well, if if Bree signed off, you know, people might look at it and say, well, oh, if Bree signed off on it, then it must be okay." So I do have to be very careful about things like that. I kind of made a decision early on. Not to do like the corporate endorsement stuff. And and you're probably aware of this too. Like once you get like kind of like a platform online or any kind of like following, you'll start getting reach outs because people are just trying to like, you know, reach an audience. They want to connect with your audience. So they'll be like, well, hey, will you, you know, do this for this brand or this for that brand? I was like, no, I I don't, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't think that's a fit. I really want to stay true to the people. (laughs) Like, and you know, cause I, I, and I feel like that's, not just my calling, but I just feel a responsibility to that. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like whatever legitimacy I have or if people are looking for me for, for my word or my commentary on things, it's because they know that, like, I do genuinely care about the people and, mm-hmm. like, like where are the masses of people at. And it's not just a come up for me, you know? Um, and so I really kind of focus more on talking to students a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really think students are like, you know, students are so crucial. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time just doing education and, and talking with students and speaking at universities and schools and, and community groups and, uh, and, you know, doing that kind of thing. And um, I'm trying to remember the second part of your question. Nah, yeah. The second part of the question is, and matter of fact, I'm going to redact that. Um, I'm going to jump right into where I wanted to go. Cause how do you deal with, 
Um, because being that you have such a wide reach, but your reach is being a very political place and you have a lot, there's a lot of trolls, a lot of people that really safety is at risk at all times. Um, there's a lot of not only black people trolls, um, and I'm, and, and mind you, I'm not PC, so I'm gonna say stuff. You're gonna be like, black people, are like, eh, I mean, you know, black people trolls, they always want to get real deep and try to find counter arguments and stuff like that. And then you got on the other side, people, they really just, they want the status quo. They're, they're, they're really trying to, they're hanging on your every word to say, boom, boom, boom. So how do you deal with that? And have you grown in dealing with that? Like, how'd you originally deal with, man, I just did out to love my heart to go take on the flag. And all of a sudden I got, love but then a lot of hate and the hate sometimes is from people like that, that are black so how do you deal with that so on the online space <laughs> i do believe in the strategic clapback right <laughs> which is like you know i'm not because people think like you know on the, the online space people say and do things that they would not do face to face you know what i mean um and sometimes people do feel an entitlement like to your space that they really don't have an entitlement to. And so especially like in the beginning, I got a lot of nasty, you know, kind of attacks and, and I would just have to snap back. Like I would have to let people know <laughs> that, you know, I'm not always going to do this, but if you say something to me, there's a chance that I will say something back and mm. I can be very sharp with my tongue, you know, mm. and like with my word. And, um, and so I did do that in the beginning. And sometimes, you know, occasionally I will say things back, but, um, but I also just largely choose not to engage. Like, I mean, that, that has been, a powerful thing too for me to realize like you know what I don't have to engage like it's yeah. not that's a choice like you you really don't have to engage with everything like everything is not worth your time and energy like um Bernie's King actually Dr. King's daughter she will tweet that out like every once in a while just to remind everybody like mm -hmm. you know mind your energy like everything is not worth giving your energy to you mm -hmm. know, and I think that's very real. Like you, you have to be wise about like, what are you, what are you pouring your energy into? And you also have to think about like, sometimes I'll catch myself and I'm like, you know, how much energy am I pouring into the people who are negative versus pouring the energy into the people who are like supportive of what I'm doing? Cause I want to make sure that I'm not giving all of my attention to like the naysayers and not pouring attention into like the many people who are, who are genuinely supportive, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, nah, I think, I think that's critical. Um, so let's do it like this as a couple, I'm a, uh, this interview is going to be all over the place, but it, it is, that's where my head is at right now because there's so much, so much good stuff. And I want to make sure I'm a good steward at the time. Um, you are privy to a lot of information, a lot of, um, data. Cause you really, you you really study stuff. And there's a lot, quite frankly, that the black community does not know specifically about politics, about the way things work, about collective organizing. So I wanted to just use a, a snippet of our time to really unpack some 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 things that you you from your knowledge that we probably just are not aware of that we should be aware of in the next six months over the next year i think the next year is critical we have a lot of steam in a lot of different areas however there's a lot of there's so much right now going to the culture just diverting attention right we have george floyd we have brianna we have so much i mean we still got them on aubrey we got things popping off every single day then we have what's going on with the covid which is a whole different synopsis of things then we got the finance sector. So A, where do you spend your energy? Um, and then B, what, and you, and you can take as long as you want. What are some things and some resources that people can use to just kind of make quality decisions on where they put their, their time on learning and talking about as, as before they move, take steps forward? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So I, right now, I'm really focused on housing. Mm, um, okay. And I mean, I can, you know, if you want to, I can kind of like take you through the take journey of my story. activism and how I landed there. So, and this kind of answers your second question too, which is that my suggestion to people is to start with something that you care about. Because I guarantee you all these issues are interconnected. Like you're right. Like you mentioned, you know, police violence, you mentioned um, COVID, you mentioned um, the economic situation. And really all of those things are connected. They're separate issues, but they're also all the way connected because we have an issue where our government is spending more money on uh, police, militarizing the police than giving us health care that we need. Right. Um, then providing people with unemployment benefits. So all of those things are tied together. Um, and so my suggestion would be like, if you're trying to learn more about the issues to really start with something that's personal to you or something that you care about, what, what, what first launched me into like a point where I was like, yes, I really want to be an activist. I really want to take action. It was like, it was two things. And it was in 2013. It was the Supreme court gutting the voting rights act and the state of North Carolina 
trying to pass this uh, like monster voter suppression bill. It was so clearly trying to make it harder for black people to vote. And it was the the uh, verdict in the Trayvon Martin case. Mm-hmm. Those two things together really made me say to myself, like, well, well, now, wait a second. What's happening here? Because it's like we're about it. We're back in 1955 again. We got a modern day Emmett Till and we don't have a Voting Rights Act anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so starting there is where I really started to study issues more, started to learn more about history. You know what I mean? So it can sometimes feel like so overwhelming, mm-hmm. the scope of it all. But I promise you, if you just like pick a starting point that makes sense for you, right, the rest of it will open up for you. So after like, you know, getting involved in the movement, of course, you know, we started having uh case after case of of police brutality, people getting killed by the police mm-hmm. that kind of came to the forefront. I I have ended up focusing on housing, though, because I really think like after studying a lot of issues, I think that the housing issue is so central to a lot of other things. So like right now, I'm sure you're aware we got a situation where we're looking at like millions of people possibly getting evicted Mm. from their home in the the next couple of months. Right. Um, If people don't have safe, stable housing, how are they going to shelter in place with the pandemic? Right. Uh, If people don't have safe stable housing, how are they going to be able to vote? Like you got to have an address in order to vote. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that issue by, by like focusing on the issue of housing and trying to see, can we keep people from getting evicted from their homes? That's what I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that through that, I can help make impact on a lot of other things. I mean, and again, it it ties back to the policing too, because the question that we have for the city, we look at the budget and we're like, let's take the instance of Charlotte, right? Yeah. Charlotte, Spent fifty million dollars. They assigned fifty million dollars in the budget for the RNC alone. That's a three day convention. Fifty million dollars to give the police more equipment for that convention. That's not even happening now. So it's not even necessary. Mm. Fifty million dollars is also our entire housing budget. Like the entire budget that's allocated to help people um, pay their rent is fifty million dollars. So what that what does that say about the city's priorities, right? Um, And imagine if we were to put all of that funding towards housing, we would probably address a lot of the the crime. Right. Like like Mm -hmm. if you if we would put if we would put funding and resources towards public health issues, um, towards education, towards things that improve quality of life, it would probably be more effective in addressing issues like crime than constantly giving the police more guns and more weapons. when we know the police are out here killing people who haven't even committed crime. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so it's and, and I didn't start out there like uh, when I got involved in 2013, I wasn't thinking about housing. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's not where I was. And that's why I'm saying like a, a really good place to start. If you want to learn more about the issues, start with something that's impacting you because mm-hmm. every issue is valid. What, what, I mean, what's for some people, it's student loans. Are you are you underwater with student loans? Start there. Like, let's look at that. Start peeling back the layers for, for why that is. Why did we go from decades ago using to have a uh, uh, free public college to now people being tens of thousands of dollars in debt. It didn't used to be that way and Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you can really kind of start wherever you're at and just, and just continue to study and, and you'll start to get like more of an analysis around the system. And I I promise you, like, that's what I'm saying. All of these issues are interconnected. It's just a matter of like, as you study, you will see how it's all connected. And you keep saying referencing study. What is study? And I know study may vary from person to person. But what does study look like for you? Because some people are like, okay, I have my issue, but I don't know where to start at all. So you say study. Is it studying articles? Is it studying people? Is it studying like studying books? Our forefathers? Like, what? Where, where would you suggest people start? All of that. Yes. <laughs> so you can see behind me. This is like some of like my book collection. I got like the John Lewis book up there. So I've got like some of these books are like history, you know, historical uh, documentation. Some of them are like um, just deep diving on the issues, giving you just like, you know, facts. Like I have a, a book up here about evictions and it's just talking about like the whole business that people make money off of evicting people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, break it down real quick. That, like, right, like, start- let's get real meta with that. Like, people make money off evicting people. Like, can you break it down real quick? So I tell you. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, we have eviction courts, right? So you got people who are paid to, to, uh, do the whole like process in the courts of evicting people. Um, you have the police who are paid to put people out on the streets. Um, you have uh, predatory landlords, mm-hmm. right, who make money off of renting to people who they know won't be able to uh, pay the rent, people who they can exploit. And they're able to like kick them out. 
um, and make money off of them. You have the moving companies make money off of evicting people, right? So, so everybody, you have like a segment of the population mm-hmm. that cannot afford a mortgage, can't afford a home, um, is, is really struggling to pay rent mm-hmm. and everybody's making money off of them being in that situation, right? Um, so it's a whole industry and that's part of why it's like, it's like difficult because whenever you start to try to make these changes, you start messing with people's money. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you're going to find like, if you follow the money on things, that's what will really show you what is really behind a lot of the decisions that are being made. It's always about the money. That's what's behind most of the, the things and, and, and how the decisions are made. Mm. So yeah, so articles, films, uh, books, um, listening to TED talks and panels. I mean, you know, you just immerse yourself in it, you know, and, and, and just, I, I really commit to being like a lifelong student. I never consider myself to be an expert. Like I have learned everything there is to learn. There's nothing left to learn. You know, um, I just am always trying to find like, what is that next thing I'm going to read? What is that next thing I can watch, mm-hmm. you know, that will help me sharpen my understanding uh, talk to your elders, talk to the people around you. You know what I mean? There's a wealth of knowledge um, sometimes in the people who are just around you have, who have lived through these things. You know, my grandma has been one of the most important educators in my life and mm-hmm. helping me understand stuff because she would just break down to me the past so I can understand. You know, when I was growing up in the 90s, my grandma was explaining to me like, you know, South Carolina in the 20s. So I can have some context for what I'm seeing, you know, in the 90s and the 2000s. Man, that's, that's, that's huge. So, um, let's do it like this. Uh, cause I want to, we're, we're going to get to the origin story, but I just want to switch gears. I'm going to be switching gears all over the place, but I want to switch gears real quick. What is, what has it been like? Uh, cause I know own network, my mom, my mom called me. He's like, yo, 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 uh, Marcus's, Marcus's wife was on the thing. And I was like, it's funny that my, my people that know you, they, they all, they always say Marcus's wife. I was like, she was on Oprah never. Oh my God. Oh my God. I was like, mom. Okay. Thank you, mom. And then, you know, over the last couple of years, being able to, get an NAACP award, um, speak on different panels. Just kind of walk us through some of the good and some of the not cha- good and challenges um, with having those platforms. Sometimes you sit back and be like, this is cool. Like, I know you want to be deep because you like you're in it in movement and it's really real. And the message you deliver is not a, it's not a sweet message at times. Right. But you said something like, yo, I'm, I really enjoy this. This is cool. Like, do you do that sometimes? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Like I really feel fortunate and privileged because First of all, like there's a lot of people who have done amazing things. Uh, we would not have like the freedoms that we have were it not for them. And people don't call their names out. Nobody gave them an award. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They some of them died in prison. Some of them got exiled. Like, you know what I mean? So I'm very much aware of like the, the privileges and the blessings. I have, which is why I celebrate that. And it's great. You know, um, that's beautiful. I appreciate that so much. Um, to, to have people say, you know, thank you for what you do. Like while I'm alive, that's yeah. amazing. Cause everybody <laughs> doesn't get that. Everybody really doesn't get that, you know, um, challenges. Yes, absolutely. Like, and you kind of touched on it earlier. Like there is this aspect to it now that I don't think existed before where activism is like cool and it has like this kind of like celebrity component to it. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, that's kind of precarious. We have to be real careful with that. Um, you know, we, we have to be real careful with like, with trying to make it like flashy and, and, you know, being about like, like who, who's, who's in the magazine, who has an award, you know what I mean? Like, cause I, I'm in magazines and I do get awards, but I also want to be really careful about that because I know like there, again, there are a lot of people, they're doing this work because they're trying to survive point blank period. No, they're not doing it for awards. They're not doing it for attention. Um, and I never want to lose sight of that. Like, I really do feel like I have been given like a gifting and a calling to, to be a communicator. Like, I think that is, I think that's my role, right. Is to like, it's like to communicate things and to speak on things. Um, but I never want to find myself in a position of like forgetting the larger collective that I belong to or just like getting, or just getting sucked into like the whole spotlight and stuff of it all. Cause you'll lose yourself in that. And fame is crazy. Like fame is real crazy. So it was very weird. Like when I took the flag down, I went into jail, mm-hmm. right? For like seven hours I was in jail. When I came out, the whole world around me had, had reoriented to how it interacted with me. Cause now, <laughs> cause now I'm the woman that took the flag down. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Now, now I'm the woman that took the flag down. And it's like, that was very strange to have, 
to be the same exact person that you were, but to have the world, the way that the world interacts with you change is very strange. And I understand then how fame can really flip some people out. Like if you're, if you're not grounded and if you're not careful, it can really, you can lose your sense of self. You really have to know who you are because everybody will start to form their own images and ideas of who you are. And if you don't know who you are, then you'll kind of get lost in that, Mm. you know, which brings us to a great price. And now let's go back to the start. Now I know people that they new to me, Y'all gonna be like, bro, this dude is all over the place. With the people that been uh over a hundred episodes in, they said, yo, this is this is this is normal G Hill. So let's go back to the start. We want to give all that context to bring it back to the start. Cause one of the most interesting things I found out was when I talked to Marcus, and I was like, okay, yeah, Bree's an activist. She must have been activist her whole life. She he was like, yo, I mean, she was, but I mean, she's a award winning um uh, documentarian, and my, like she she writes screenplays and plays the piano. I was like, bro, like. She on the front line taking out flags. Like, why was she like, what? For real? No, she went to New York School of Arts and all this. I'm like, bro, for real? So let's, let's take it back. Take us back to from when you were born to kind of now. And I know this a, in, in, in the context that you know how to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, as early as I can remember, I love the arts, right? Mm-hmm. So I was, I was, um, I was born in North Carolina. My family moved up to Maryland when I was like, I was a baby, you know what I mean? So I did like all my grade school in Maryland, but I would spend all my summers in North Carolina with my grandma in Charlotte. And one of the things that she got me and my sister into really early on was the Afro-American Children's Theater in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Um, And so so I was doing that from the time I was like five, you know, like real little and just loved it. I just loved being creative. I loved writing, doing music, like all of that kind of stuff. And so... I mean, really, like up until the point that I got arrested <laughs> for like <laughs> protesting voting rights, that was my focus. Like, like very seriously, like I was just, you know, I was really focused on. Um, I knew that I knew that I wanted to do something in the arts, and then by the time I got to like maybe like middle school, I was pretty sure I wanted to be a filmmaker. Like, I, I was really, I loved films. Mm-hmm. I loved watching films. And I was pretty sure that I wanted to be a filmmaker. And then by the time I got to high school, I was like, yeah, I want to study film. Like, that's Mm -hmm. what I want to do. I want to go to college and and, and study film um, and become a filmmaker. I graduated college. I did a a short film called Wake that was really successful. Mm -hmm. Um, Got the you mentioned when you're reading my bio, I got the artist residency in New York. So, you know, I'm up in New York in like 2011, (laughs) 2012, you know, just grinding paying, you know, exorbitant rent, <laughs> like sleep in a closet, you know, just like doing the New York grind, like everything an artist, you know, the, the typical artist path, like you got to grind it out. You got to, you got you know, got to earn your stripes and put in your time. And that's what I was doing. And, um, and then, like I said, I, I, so I finished the residency. I came back to North Carolina and honestly, I had not really been following closely what was happening in North Carolina. Like wow. I, I would follow politics, right? But I wasn't really like tuned in on, on what was happening. And stuff in North Carolina was crazy because in, you know, in 2008, the state went for Obama. Mm-hmm. And then two years later, the Republicans, like in backlash to that, they took over the legislature here. Mm-hmm. And they just went bananas in terms of like trying to like roll everything back, starting with like taking voting rights away. And so that was, I mean, that was the moment where I was like, well, now, wait a second. You know, I don't know if I can go back to just like sitting in an office because, you know, Sachi's like a very corporate environment. This is an advertising agency, yeah. you know. And I was like, I don't think I can, I don't think I personally can go back to like doing a nine to five in an office setting when this is going on. I really want to be out in the streets protesting with people. Like that's where I'm at. That's where I'm feeling. Um, And so that's, that's how I landed there. It was not like I, there was no point prior to that where I was like, oh, I'm going to be an activist. <laughs> I'm going to be getting arrested. Like, no, not at all. You know, because I really thought all I saw all of that stuff is like largely behind us. Like I knew we still had issues, obviously. Yeah. I knew there was still stuff to protest about. But I thought that I thought we were further along than we were. It was opening to me to realize like, no, like we're really not like this is this is this is a lot more recent. Then I think I was understanding, you Mm. know, and even my mom said to me, she was like, she was like, I'm not sure that our generation did as much to really help y'all understand what came before y'all, you know, because we came along, you know, we come up, Bill Cosby's on TV. I mean, we we really came up in an era where it was like everywhere you looked, it was like successful black people, black people, you know what I mean? 
And so that was like wild to really see the backlash to Obama in particular, like how it just kind of like unleashed this like racist element in the country, you know? Yeah, nah, that's, there's a lot there. And something just jumped in my mind. Uh, you know, J. Cole, re- and J. Cole is one of my favorite artists of all time. Um, J. Cole released his album and I think I, before that, before the song, it got a little controversy because he, uh, he didn't attack, but he, he threw some, threw some shade, not shade. He just talked about a, a person that came from a two parent household and had a lot to say about things. And I know, I mean, you look at your, your profile, right? Like, you I mean, your dad is a big meech. He's a big meech at what he do. Like he was, he had a lot of weight <laughs> in these streets and your mom, she held her right, right too. Like you're, you, you come from, um, I mean, I, I don't want to say, but you may seem you come from a place of privilege, right? And so what is, how, how did you get so low to the soil? And I'm, when I say low, I'm not saying as far as the people you're working with are low, but as far as to the ground root of all these movements, when you did not come from that, you didn't come from that space. And do you at times, and that's the first question, and do you at times feel kind of, how do you mitigate the fact that there are people that live and come from that space too, that haven't reached any of the heights and maybe doing some of the same work, but you have been positioned to kind of be the, the, the lead lady, but you come from a different environment. So, um, yeah, can you just kind of unpack that? Yeah, definitely. So I think I, I would definitely describe myself. I mean, I came from a black middle class family. Like, like I said, I grew up, I remember when Cosby used to come on on Thursday nights and that looked like my family. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like I saw myself reflected back on, on TV. Um, so that was not, that was not strange to me. Um, uh, you know, in the black middle class itself, like a lot of us, we it, we are in the position that we are because for whatever reason, generations ago, we were descended from some folks that were able to get some land. Yeah, that was my, you know, my my great 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 granddaddy. Yeah, was a blacksmith on the plantation and was able to like save up some money and have some land. And because he was able to do that, you know, my grandparents' generation was able to go to college. You know what I mean? And that really can like change the trajectory. For for how your family, you know, is able to to um, to prosper. You know what I mean? That's just the reality. Um, But that said, I really was raised with a conscience always kind of around these issues. So like my mom, she was an educator. Her work really focused on inequality in education, though. So I was always I was always like aware Mm -hmm. of the advantages that I had. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I was I was always seeing like all the kids who did not have those kinds of things. So so I had that kind of um, that kind of awareness with me always. And of course, my grandma was telling me about how she was poor. (laughs) You know, this is my my mom's mom, you know, and my my mom's mom. This is the one I was telling you was born in 1920s, South Carolina. She would stay with us during the year. So my my grandma was like helping raise me. You know, I'm I'm grandma raised in a lot of ways. (laughs) Uh You know what I mean? Um, and so, so she was, she always made me aware of those kinds of things. I was aware that like, I was the first generation in my family to go to integrated public school, you wow. know? Um, I, I just knew those things, you know what I mean? Um, and so I'm aware of that now as well, like, you know, being invited to like give lectures at universities and stuff like that. Would I have those same kind of opportunities if I hadn't had the, you know, the chance to like go to college and, and know how to like give a lecture? I don't know. Probably not. You know, mm-hmm. um, that's a very real thing. Um, and no, you, you're absolutely right. Like people who there are people who are who are fighting every day on the front line um, who are coming from more impoverished circumstances mm-hmm. um, and they don't they don't get those same kind of kind of privileges. They don't get those same kind of uh, um, protections. You know, um, there have always been like a lot of people who have been freedom fighters and have died in poverty, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so that's like a that's a very real thing that I'm, I'm always aware of. Sometimes I almost feel like a, I don't want to say like a. Um, survivor's guilt, but just like this awareness of like being one who has survived at least so far. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, I think especially of like uh, the, the folks who rose up in Ferguson, you know, like, like these are the people who who really make a lot of the, the revolutionary energy possible and they don't have the same kinds of, of protections that some of us have. You know, everybody doesn't get a book deal. Everybody doesn't get a speaking gig. That's just the reality of it. Yeah. Um, and so, and so again, like, you know, when I was talking earlier about like having to guard against co-optation, having to guard against like 
you know, getting too caught up in celebrity and stuff like that, that all comes back to it. Um, to a certain extent, like people sometimes talk about the concept of class suicide. And that's the person who's like, who's like almost willing to die to the, to the class level that they were born into, right? Because if you really believe, like, let's say you were born into, uh, the privileged classes, right? So you're, you're, you're born into like the elite classes, the, the class of the oppressor. Um, and if you really believe in, in liberation for all people, you're going to have to die to some of that bourgeoisie, you know, kind of belief in attitude. You got to die to some of that elitism. Um, and we have to be willing sometimes to really confront how much we have internalized some of that kind of stuff, you know, um, because it can really hinder our ability to like build solidarity. The reality is like, yes, I am middle class, but I am so much closer to homeless <laughs> than I am to billionaire. Yeah. And that's a reality. <laughs> yeah. That's a reality. You know, when, when the, when the housing crisis hit, it hit my family. Yeah. You know, that hit my family. Um, I was I experienced housing instability for a little bit um, as an adult myself. You know what I mean? So some of it, too, is like also recognizing this precarious nature of, of middle class and how like in this country, like, you know, folks kind of fall into this illusion of like we're wealthy. We're not wealthy. Like we're, we're still working people. We're just we're just doing OK. You know what I mean? Like, okay. like we're, we want to take away. We still want to take away a couple yeah, checks exactly. away. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know what I mean? So so making sure you don't lose sight of that, you know, it, it makes more sense to be in solidarity with with the folks who are poor than trying to be in solidarity with the billionaires because you're not a billionaire. You're not wealthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think they're capitalists like that conversation has been coming up a lot too. folks like I'm a capitalist. No, you're not. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like you maybe be a, maybe you're aspiring to be a capitalist but unless you have wealth where like your money can actually work for you like you don't have to go work today you don't have to earn a paycheck you're not a capitalist like you are you are working class we are working class people <laughs> you know what i mean yeah i mean yeah. you a professional a professional is a working class person mm -hmm. you're just you're just you know you're better off than yeah. than some other folks and what jumps out to me um in your head uh when when we were talking uh, what we're talking right now is the, 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 the word responsibility, right? So you have a certain responsibility being that, I mean, God has given you a unique gift, a unique platform, um, things that of course you work for, but also two things that before you, like you said, it don't happen without your grandparents land, right? And then it's a circular effect. And then, like you said, you're on the ground level with people that unfortunately at this point, they can't do certain things you do. So you have a certain responsibility. So my question is, what do you feel your responsibility responsibility is to the culture? But also, too, what do you feel is the general for and let and let I want to speak to two classes. So it's a long question. Your responsibility, the responsibility for those that are um, that are our age, um, and that is between twenty seven to thirty five that are particularly well off. And when I say well off, I mean they have a they have a job and they have a roof for the head, corporate job, whatever. And when, when I say responsibility, I'm responsibility to the culture, right? And then, and of course, this is your opinion. And then the last thing, responsibility for those that um may unfortunately just, hey, they're still where they're at. They're still they're still maybe struggling. They're still check to check, and and there's unique causes. I, I've always been interested to see what is your what is your thoughts on your personal, um, middle class, and also to um those that are are socially and economically challenged. Yeah, so I think it's really important, especially as Black people to recognize that we will never socially elevate above racism. So mm -hmm. long as so long as like the white power structure and this this racist capitalist system exists as it is, mm -hmm. I don't care how and again that's something that I feel like the Obama era made so clear especially for me. It doesn't matter how much education you have, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much money you earn, right? You can be the president of the United States, they're still going to call you a monkey, mm -hmm. right? Um and so what that says is that you have a choice to make. And of course, you know, my, I think the responsible choice is to stand in solidarity with black people all around the world and to recognize how precarious this whole thing is. Again, we are, you're talking about folks who are doing well, kind of like in our age group. We're doing well today. Ooh. We got to recognize that. We got to, we got to recognize how precarious this is. The housing crisis that hit in 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. took something like a third of our wealth. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you have to check that. I'm not sure if I'm saying the number exactly correct, but it was a significant amount of our wealth gone because as black people, most of our what wealth we do have is in uh, 
our mortgages. It's in, it's in our home ownership. We don't have generational wealth. I mean, even, even the, you know, black middle class, like we don't have, we don't have white wealth. (laughs) Yeah. We don't. Nowhere near. Nowhere near. Black bourgeoisie and white bourgeoisie are nowhere (laughs) near each other. Okay. And that's really important to understand. Like your black bourgeoisie, if your family has like a hundred thousand dollars, right? Average, average for white people is like a hundred. 40,000. Okay. So we are, so what is, what is, that's average. And this is a hundred thousand liquid outside of mortgage. Exactly. And so that's why like, you know, you'll see white people are able to like open up businesses, open up restaurants just by going to their family and asking for money. We can't do that. Most of us can't do that. Mm -hmm. Even if you do come from a family that has some stuff, we don't have that kind of liquid cash. It's like, Oh, you know, I want to go. It's open one up person a, in the family. Oh. It's not the whole family. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Because you know, you exactly. can probably look at your cousins and they live in different lives than even your father and their father's brother. Oh, you want uncle away for somebody that's in jail, that's been murdered, that sold drugs, or that's been wrongly incarcerated. You want cousin away where other families they have, they can all go on summer vacations. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, that's, that, you know, I mentioned earlier, like my grandparents being able to go to college, all their siblings didn't go to college. Mm-hmm. And that made a tremendous difference. You know what I mean? In terms of how things, how things played out. Um, so, so we are not, we are not wealthy. We are not old money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and that, that's really important to understand because sometimes we get very caught up in these capitalistic ideas that are not really serving our interests and are not really for us. And we're chasing a carrot that's being dangled in front of our faces that we will never catch. We, and it, it, and any time that it seems like we are starting to catch up, the white elite will do things to make sure that we don't. I mean, that, that's what's happening right now in this pandemic era. Like they are using this era as an opportunity to create more gap, right? What's happening now with the situation with the schools? Well, if the schools are closed down, they, their kids are taken care of. They can afford private tutors. They can afford like all these other things. If our kids are going to public school, a lot of our kids are falling behind if we can't provide those kinds of resources, right? So I think having a class consciousness, when I, when I say responsibility, having a class consciousness, having a race consciousness around these things, and also having an international consciousness around on these things. Sometimes as black Americans, we get very focused on just like what's happening in America. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot happening around the world. As black people, this is a situation. I don't care where we go in the world. Mm-hmm. If you are black, it's the same situation. It's not just America. So we, we have to have that kind of like awareness. Um, and then for the folks that are that are not well off, you know, I mean, I it's hard for me to say like what their responsibility yeah. is because what I see is people giving their all. Like when I talk about like this housing issue, I'm working with people where they're fighting for housing rights and they're, they're struggling to figure out how to pay their own rent. Um, their, their whole family's infected with COVID and mm. they're trying to take care of their, you know, family and they're trying to figure out how to, how to work. They got to, they're like the essential workers. They got to go out and be on the front line. They don't have the privilege of, you know, sheltering in place. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so, you know, I think that for us all to be responsible to each other is just about having this like collective idea, this collective care, you know, the idea of like, I am because we are, you know, am I good? Well, I can only be as, I can only be so good based on like where everybody's at. That's the reality. Any, any black person could tell you that. I mean, there's a lot of black people. You, yeah, you get some money. You go and you move out in a white neighborhood. Okay. Let's see how, like, how, how well are you really doing? Somebody might call the cops on you because they're like, you don't belong here. You know what I mean? So you, you can't really just like buy your way out of it. Mm. Um, and that's what I mean about having like race consciousness and class consciousness. Cause those two things are intertwined. Like if they weren't, then again, like if you got a certain amount of money, it wouldn't matter that you were black, right? That's mm. not, that's not how it works. We know that. Mm. So right. what do you believe? And this is, like I said, this is a pain. This is your chance to really just show your pain on things and questions. What do you think is the root of why we're in our culture right now? We are so we built on, it, especially myself at times, but all right, we trying to, all right, we trying to blow this podcast up. We trying to be a phenomenal speaker. We trying to do this. We trying to get this bread. We trying to put all the people on so they can all get money so we can go vacation. And it's like, hold up, hold up. So we're trying to get money so we can move in places that really don't like us to be at jobs that really don't really want us there, to go to places that really don't even want us there visiting. And it's like, but that is the auspice of a lot of you. You go on Instagram and not to call people out because, I mean, but I, but it's like everything that we're building 
is to be in places that we're not really excited. They're not excited of us to be there. And then we tell ourselves that, hey, well, I'm going to be the guy and I'm going to change that culture and I'm going to be the guy that we need representation. But where, where do you, is there a line to be drawn? And I know that's kind of a, you can get into a judgy space with that. But from your, for your opinion, because I know you have some strong stances on certain things, but what is, what is your really thoughts? Because right now we've been, that's where we're at for a lot of people to go get it. So, yeah. So, I mean, I'm a revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I don't, I don't think that our goal should be to, uh, be a part of the white institution, right? Because the definition, what makes the institution white is our exclusion. As soon as like, so, so let's say like, yeah, that's the goal. That's, that's a, that's a reasonable goal. Uh, it, it makes sense that that's a normal human thing. <laughs> like mm-hmm. every, everything that you're expressing is normal and human. That's okay. Like, I don't think people should feel bad for having the same kind of ambitions that any normal person would have. Mm-hmm. But I'm just saying like, we really need to interrogate what does that mean? Right. So let's look at like the Ivy league schools, for instance, right? Yep. Like the universities. Right. Um, and we'll, we'll fixate so much on like who can get into Harvard, Harvard who can get into Princeton. the white yep. institution. Right. But the whole thing that make that those are institutions that were built for the slave masters mm-hmm. that like that. That's literally what the institution was built for. Not even all working white people could get into that institution. Look, look at UVA. Thomas Jefferson built UVA to educate the, the slave owning planter class. They have they have rooms there that used to uh, used to be for housing their slaves that they would bring to them when they went to the campus. That institution, the way that it was designed, the way that it was theorized was never for our inclusion. Mm -hmm. Right. So the only way that that institution can include us is for that institution to be completely transformed. Right. Which is an okay thing. That's an okay goal. Like if the goal is for us to transform the institution so that it's no longer this thing that is about serving the white elite, but is about the the surrounding community. Right. And is about educating and transforming. Everyone is about being, you know, accessible and serving everyone. That's an attainable goal. What's problematic is when we're judging our value by our ability to be the only black person in the room. Mm. (laughs) That's when it's a problem. Right. And sometimes we can really get in that and tell, oh, look at me. I'm the only black person. That's not good to be the only black person. You know what I mean? Sometimes we'll make a big deal about being the first. Oh, I'm the first black person here in the year 2019. That looks bad on the institution. <laughs> like, like, you know, bless you. But is that really your accomplishment or is that is that really showing how messed up the institution is? Because you're not it's not that you're the first black person that was qualified to be that. Right. We've Mm -hmm. always had black people that were qualified to be there. They just weren't allowed to be there. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? So that's where I think like we just have to be careful about over romanticizing being in proximity to whiteness and and white people and 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 white ideas like that's where we get ourselves into trouble. Right. Because it's not really about the uplift of everybody. And the reality is like none of us are going to get free until there's uplift. Like, Like I don't I don't care. Like. You, so long as you're, like I said, it doesn't matter. You can be the most talented person in the space. And in fact, if you are the most talented in the person, uh, most talented person in the space, they're going to hate you even more <laughs> because they know that you're the most, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like th- that's the kind of like consciousness that we, we have to operate with. Man, that's uh, you, you, you said a lot right there. And it's, it's crazy growing up and this is, oh man, it's perfect. Segue into where I want to go growing up. I used to, that was one of my things. I went to A&T, we had great grades and something in my head was like, man, it, I used to get off growing up like, yo, I'm the only dude here. Like, this is it. Yo, we, we made it. Like, okay, cool. We in, we in, we in an internship and this is all white colleagues and myself. And it's like, okay, cool. But then I was like, hold up. Like you said, is this, is this, is this where I want to be? Is it like, I know, and it's, and it's crazy even. And, and I, I used to, I was, I was bad. That's I, once I grew out of that, then I became like, hold up, man. Like, I ain't even giving no love to anybody. I care less if you go to Ivy League school. You is anti or nothing. It's, it's NC Central or nothing. It's, it's this or nothing. Because I mean, I see so many people like you know. Just look online when somebody says, "Hey, I'm going to Harvard." It's a billion shares. It's oh my god. Let's and, and then when somebody says, "I'm going to Central," I'm going to Livingstone, and they have the and I ain't gonna comment on those institutions, not Livingstone in particular, but it's not the same response, right? And then unfortunately, it, mean, it makes me as a black person, I used to be get kind of angry, like man, like. 
okay, why are they so excited about going to Harvard? Now I'm tearing down a brother. They just, hey, they might just want to go to Harvard. They might want to go to Penn. So I feel like we're always in a weird space as black people because you want to support people that go to places that we're not at. But then you're like, damn, why are you going so far from the culture? So where, how do you, how do you, how, how do we relegate that? Because we shouldn't have to relegate that. We should just be, hey, man, you go to Penn. You going to Yale, you going to Wharton, you going to NYU, you went to NYU, Bree. Like you went to NYU, yeah. you went to Tish. Tish is not no easy school. Tish is very elite. Yeah. Very elite. Yeah. So how do we rectify that? Yeah, I mean, I think again, the important thing to recognize is that the white power structure is trying to deny us education. Period. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you know what I mean? So so that's why. You have people like like let's go back and let's look at the history of of why we have historically black colleges and universities to begin with because we were not allowed to attend the white institutions. There were court cases where you had students um, suing the state because the they the state refused to provide funding for the black school to have a major Mm -hmm. that you could only take at the white school. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why I ended up going to NYU was because I wanted to study film. And I I think things have have changed a bit now, but I mean, just as recently as what, 2003, 2004, when I was a freshman, Mm -hmm. um, there was only a handful of schools where you could go and like actually put your, your hands on film. um, If you wanted to study film and have the resources that really utilize tools. And that's a whole different conversation. Like New York, you probably had a lot of stuff to, to work with. It's a very expensive program. You know, a medical school is expensive. <laughs> you know, like there, there are certain majors that cost a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we are deliberately deprived of funding at our black institutions and schools. So, so that's what creates that dynamic where, where you have black students, some black students really trying to fight to get into white institutions, um, just so they can, can gain access to things. Same thing with our athletic programs, mm-hmm. right? We don't get that. We have in our community the majority of the athletic talent, top athletic talent. Period. Period. Undeniable. <laughs> Undeniable. But if you want to be able to go to for a lot of for a lot of black student athletes, if you want to go somewhere that can put you on track to go to the NFL, you got to go to the white school. Go to you Alabama. Know what I mean? Alabama right. of all places. Alabama. Think about it. You going to Alabama? All this black talent, but the history of Alabama, Arkansas. These are the, Florida, like. South Carolina. Right, right. And so that's why, again, I say, like, we have to be careful of, of like, that we in our in our mentality are not equating the white space with superiority. It's not superior. It's not. What, what it is is that it's more funded. And that is a that is structural. That is a deliberate policy decision that is being made to make sure that the majority of us are are denied access to that kind of thing. Imagine if we had equal funding for for our schools and institutions. We wouldn't be going to those schools. Like we wouldn't be fixated on, you know, uh who got to go into cuz I'm I'm going to tell you like the truth. And if you if you get a chance to be in like a lot of white spaces and elite spaces, you're going to find out very quickly it ain't nothing superior it's not <laughs> like it's it's a lot of it's a lot of smoke and mirrors and funding um wealthy white people have the same issues that everybody else has i don't know how much i can say on the podcast but i'm just going to no, tell say, you no you like, can say whatever you want like you <laughs> I mean, you you got free reign you you if anything i thought i would be a governor now you can go ahead but I mean, I mean, it's very true. There were several students at the school. Some of them have been in rehab before coming to college. Mm-hmm. OK, so it's not it's not that wealthy white people are superior, morally superior, <laughs> intellectually Hell or any no. of those things. It's it's resources. It's that some people are allowed to have access to resources and other people are deprived. We are coming generationally from a people who were forced to work without earning anything for generations, for hundreds of years. We, our wealth has been stolen and reallocated to wealthy white people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, when I'm talking about like the consciousness and like the collective consciousness and like our power lies in us all having that kind of understanding, it shouldn't be about pitting, you know, this black person against that black person because we're all having to make decisions on a daily basis in the reality of like this system, like, um, um, you know, against the same kind of oppression, mm. you know what I mean? That I had to make a trade off and go into NYU. That was yeah. a trade off. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like there were things going to an institution like NYU over going to an institution like, you know, Howard University or A&T or Hampton University. That's that's a trade off. There's a lot that I didn't get because I was then in a space that was like most of the people around me were white men, not even not even white people, white men. <laughs> like, yeah. when I, like when I was studying film, I mean, by the time I got to like my senior directing class, I was one of only two women. And the only person of color, very, very, very white male space. You know what I mean? Um, and so so we're we're constantly having to make these like judgments and choices, just trying to navigate the oppression. You know what I mean? And so the, the it makes more sense for us to like recognize that and organize ourselves against that than to be like in competition with each other and making judgments about each other based on the you know choices that we have to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as we, as we kind of, there's a lot more to unpack, but we're going to, we, we got, we got a little bit more to go and then we'll wrap. Um, I, I, I couldn't help but while you were talking, um, and I'm going to speak on this, but then I got a question for it. It's, it's, it's funny, man, because even in, from a personal perspective in business where there have been times in my life where, I mean, the, just the resources weren't there. As an entrepreneur, resources weren't there. Stuff was tough. And it's like, I took a lot of, the, I took a lot of uh, heat on myself and I got pressed and all this other stuff. Cause I'm like, dang, we ain't cutting it. And it was, and then, and then to think about it, it was like, yo, I had to tell myself that it had nothing to do with, um, and I just really realized this year, I questioned my character, I questioned all this stuff of myself, but I, I knew that if I had money, it would be different. And now, like I said, we have a lot more resources now. So now stuff is booming. We on a different level. But I'm like, but I look at the people that they came out and they had, Hundred thousand for their venture, a million for their venture, and if it's, if they fail to get a million more, imagine how many how many successful black businesses would have if we had it's all like you said something deep. You said hold up, the difference between Harvard and A&T is it has nothing to do with any type of quality because quality you can get quality with money, but it's the resources. You got a billion dollar, multi billion dollar endowment, or oh, shoot, you can get the best lecturers, have the best facility, all that stuff. If we had that in A&T, we'd be on the top of the level too. So. I'm glad that you said that because it's, uh, there's so much mental stuff that we endure as black people, as, as business owners, as teachers, as creative. And a lot of it's due to lack of resources. It's not because we have bad character. Cause what, what, like you said to the housing, let's unpack that. It's easy to have bad character. You have nothing. You got nothing. You have nothing. I'm hungry. I'm, a, I might have to rob you. Like at the end, because I'm just, I just, I just born to rob. We were not born to rob. We're not born savages. But if I have nothing, I'm going to take it if you got it. So man, that's really, Hmm. And if I can say even more than that, the wealthy people are robbing every day. <laughs> the president of the United States is a criminal by definition of the law, but he will never be subjected to the same kind of process that a poor person who robs a convenience store today will. You know what I mean? Like the PPP loans that they sent out, right? Mm-hmm. You're talking about access to capital for minority businesses. They handed out like billions of dollars. Most of it went to corporations that already had money. 90% of bl- small black businesses did not receive a loan. So that's what I'm saying about how like there are decisions that are being made to deliberately ensure mm-hmm. that we don't get access, that, that we, that, that gap, that that inequality remains in place. So that's the consciousness that we have to operate with. And then what they try to do is turn around and say, oh, no, it's just because it's black. No, it's not because it's black. It's because of of structural inequality. It's because of racism. Mm, and you hit on the head even like I had to fight and claw to get a PPP. But I knew that there was colleagues of mine that were not like myself. They made it one call, two calls, and they got cashed out 100 grand, 50 grand. I'm talking about like we got companies that are great companies, right? They are just serve the community all this other stuff. They can't even they can't even get through the application process without getting denied. You got companies running credit checks now. Like you ain't running credit check on my man, but now you going you digging deeper in the files. You overlooking stuff, and I'm like, bro, like you just cashed out a company for three hundred fifty grand, no questions asked. But all, it's so it's 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 and then like, are y'all really gonna give out all this free money and none of it come to us again, again, billions again, again, and y'all and you're gonna tell it we don't know we don't know paperwork. We don't, they don't know paperwork either because you'll, right. call, you'll call them and say, hey, you're missing this sign. Sign here. Oh, buddy, uh, t- change that number. If we change the number, it's fraud. We, we, right. we, we can't underwrite it. And it's, it's sickening to think about how this COVID thing has been played up to even, like you said, even be more of an advantage. So what is your take on that? I mean, to sit back and look like, wow, all this free money coming, not free money, all this money flowing, all this stuff is enacted. 
the bills and stuff is getting pushed back for the safety of everybody else. And you're looking at, no, this is going to devastate our culture. It's devastating. Even though, even the people that get unemployment, $600 is cool, but look at the long-term view of this thing. Psychologically, being at home, you get money, but you at home. Our babies, they don't have Wi-Fi. We, me, shoot, on this call, I'm having Wi-Fi issues and I'm well off. So what about the kid that's going to be like, what, what is the age chicken is learning to look like on every level? Oh right. man, have you, uh, how often do you unpack how this COVID thing is really affecting our culture? I mean, every day. <laughs> I mean, I mean, but again, this is why I'm a revolutionary because I don't believe that there is such a thing as equality. I, I don't think that we ever achieve equality in the system as it exists, right? Mm -hmm. I think that there are people who, am, who are in power. Mm -hmm. There are people who are sitting on money. There are people who are making these decisions that have to be displaced. It's, it's not going to change. These are these are decisions that they are making generation after generation after generation. Mm -hmm. um, I can name three incidents just in the past 15 years. Right. Um, Katrina. Mm -hmm. Right. In New Orleans, the water in Flint, Michigan and COVID. That's just in the past mm -hmm. 15 years. Wow. Right. Like, like this is going to be a constant thing. And I'm not saying that it, I'm not saying that it's easy, but what I'm really trying to speak to right now is shifting our mentality, right? Like we have to divest from this system. We have to divest from this idea. Like when you're talking about the, you know, the whole idea of like, oh, I, you know, I can go to Harvard and I can be the one and then I can uplift the people without having a real analysis around the institution, the fact that the institution is designed to make sure that you can't do that, you know, <laughs> like, like that, that, that's the kind of, you can't that, bring everybody the, in that trip. You can't, it's like trying to beat the, it's like trying to beat the casino. You will not <laughs> beat the casino. You might win a good hand. You might have a good run and win at, you know, a game of blackjack, but you are never going to beat the casino because the casino is rigged to make sure that the majority of people can't win. And like, when you understand that, then that's when we can start saying, okay, well, let's imagine a different kind of system. Like let's, let's, let's imagine different, different kinds of institutions. Let's imagine different kinds of laws. You know what I mean? And then we start fighting for things that will actually bring about the outcomes that, that we're looking for. Mm. And the last, uh, I got two more questions. Then we're going to culture change round to wrap it up. Uh, one, what's your, what's your take? And I know there's probably wide, but what is your, your, your take on reparations, this whole, the reparations place? I think there's a conversation is. As, uh, uh, it's, it's crazy. It's 2020 and we're just starting to have it serious. I guess serious because it's, but I'd be like, uh, so what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, no, I mean, I think the reparations conversation is essential. It's been going on. It's been theorized for a while. <laughs> theorized right? for PhDs. <clears throat> People got theses on it, PhDs on it. I'm like, where, where the damn money at, bro? Where the land? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I still, again, like, I don't believe that first of all, let's start with the fact that the United States of America cannot pay us back what they owe us. OK, mm -hmm. the United States of America owes us more than they can pay. Mm -hmm. OK, like trillions of dollars. I mean, this has been calculated like trillions of dollars of wealth mm -hmm. have been stolen from black people in mm -hmm. this country. Um, so they can't pay us back what we're owed to begin with. So then we really have to ask ourselves, well, what are we willing to accept as reparations, right? Because I, I feel like we've got to be careful that they don't turn around and say, oh, okay, here's, you know, a check, here's a check there, here's a thing there. Okay, we've solved it. And, and, and then it'll just go back to business as usual. And we'll look up 20 years later, same conditions dealing with, it'll be the new COVID, whatever it is that we're dealing with, the new Katrina, whatever it is that we're dealing with, the same thing. It's coming. Because it's because it's coming because it's not really justice. Right. So in my view, I don't think that we can have a real reparations process until after the revolution. OK. And when I, when I say revolution, like I know that's a really loaded word. Mm -hmm. Right. But revolution most basically just means a change in power. So in my mind, revolution means a situation where people like Donald Trump are not in power anymore. Right? Like, like mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. Uh, in a post-revolution, you don't have um, this just grotesque concentration of wealth among the white ownership class, right? Mm -hmm. So there would there would have to be enough organization and enough pressure to the point that we reached a point where it was like, okay, there has to be a massive wealth transfer from the like one percent of people who are sitting on you know billions and billions and billions of dollars of wealth um, to the systems and institutions, you know, free college. Um, you know, free health care, um, things, things that would actually bring people out of poverty, right? Like that, that's what we would need in my view. 
Um, I think that we have to be really careful about they, they kind of backed off of it now. I think folks started to get a little scared in that reparations conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but there for a little while during the primary, they were kind of starting to play into it. Oh yeah, let's talk about reparations. And my concern was just like they're just going to do this thing where it's like we're going to cut everybody a little check and then otherwise just keep it as business as usual. Mm-hmm. And they continue to steal more from us than they ever give back. You know what I mean? So I just I think that's what we have to be really careful of. But I think we have to keep talking. There has to be reparations. There has to be. Right. Um, I just don't. I, I think that it doesn't really happen until the people who are currently in power are displaced from power. Mm. So this is where the last two things before we jump into the the rapid fire round. One is. What has been your, throughout your journey, and this doesn't have to be your last year, but in your life, what has been your most proudest moment and what's been your most challenging moment? Um, I think definitely taking the flag down is probably my proudest moment in my life um, for, for many reasons. I think that my most challenging moment, I've really had to make some it's, it's hard for me to pinpoint one, but just kind of like just generally speaking, um, it's not always easy to like say the thing that's not popular. It's not always easy to like do the thing that, you know, is going to kind of like alienate you from from folks. You know what I mean? Like I knew that when so like after I took the flag down. There was like a period of time where, like I said, everybody wanted to kind of co-opt the image. I had, you know, Hillary Clinton was saying my name at the, you mm-hmm. know, when she's doing a rally in South Carolina. I started getting invitations from folks to come like, you know, be in space, like, Bray, you know, come you know, be in this space, be in that space. And I had to make a conscious decision where I was like, you know what? I can't do that. Like, I'm going to have to say, like, what I really think about, like, this elitism. And I'm going to have to be, like, openly critical of some of these things. And that will make you persona non grata. That will get you blacklisted, you know, <laughs> to a certain extent. Like, it's really kind of remarkable that I'm still able to, like, get the kind of platform space and, and kind of be in certain spaces that I have because I know that certain people are trying to, like, keep me from that. You know what I yeah. mean? Because I'm outspoken um, in that way. And they know that I am I will be willing to, like, openly challenge certain things, you know, um, and so, so that has been somewhat challenging, but you know what? Still, like at the end of the day, I have to be able to live with my conscience. That's just me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, like at the end of the day, my integrity, if I have nothing else, everything else can be taken from me mm-hmm. except my integrity. That's the only thing that can't be, you know, money, all that other stuff is like fleeting. It can be, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And so so it's challenging, but that's also like where I prefer to to reside. Yeah. <laughs> and then this is this is for people that um if you ideally, right? So going forward, I mean you do a lot of interviews, you do a lot of press, and sometimes you read you, I know you probably read certain things, you're like, bro, this is not what we talked about. Like, what? This is this is not the show escape. I mean, if you had it your way, how would you prefer people um, when they interview and when they're talking to you, how would you prefer the, 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 the pros be? I know it's a weird question, but I'm always interested from people that, uh, get interviewed a lot because you've probably been in some good interviews, some terrible interviews, some spaces where it's like, yo, so what would you prefer? What, what would be the best thing to really capture what you really mean though? You feel me? Cause when you got somebody to interview and they can shape it or right, especially when they're writing, they, mm-hmm. they can just miss the whole wave. And you're like, damn, you got me in the your New York Times like that. And I was like, if I'm gonna come there, I need to bring my whole message. Like what? I'm in Boston Globe. It's cool to be in these places, but you reading it like, what the heck? Like, so how would you prefer going forward to to continue to bring your whole self to 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 print and online? Well, part of what I'm hoping that I think I mentioned I'm working on this documentary project, and that's part of what I'm hoping will make it clear to people because I feel I, and I feel like sometimes that has definitely happened where I've done like interviews and I read it and I'm like, you didn't understand what I was <laughs> saying. Uh, um, but I, I don't always see that as people intentionally trying to distort it. I think sometimes people genuinely don't see it. They don't get it. Um, because, because I mean, a lot of what I'm, I'm talking about revolution. I'm talking about doing stuff outside of the Institute. You know what I mean? I'm talking about like challenging, like all of the norms. We're talking about abolishing, like, we're, like the stuff that we're talking about sounds really out there. You know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's not out there. Like when you really start to study it and understand it, but it sounds really out there compared to like where mainstream thinking is at. Right. 
Um, and so I'm hoping that the documentary project will help make that clearer to folks. Like what I mean, like when I'm talking about stuff like um, grassroots organizing, you know, um, building democratic structures outside of existing structures. You know what I mean? Like to like to really make that clear to people so they can really understand that. Um, because I think sometimes it isn't always easy to like get across to people, you know, in, in a single interview. But that's why I also I have to be careful sometimes. Like, you know, I, I won't always do like a million interviews. I've kind of learned that sometimes it's better to just do like one really good interview. Yeah, way better. You know, than like than like a bunch that are not all really sharp and, and on it, you know? Yeah, especially, I mean, until you got like a project where you just, it might require, like I know um, you mentioned, I don't know what's next as far as book or film or whatever, but I mean, there will be probably be a point where, I mean, shoot, you got to, even though you don't want to, but I mean, you have obligations, you sign some deals, you're going to have the obligations to certain press entities. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is what it is. And I know it's, I, I can only imagine, especially from yours take, cause you're not like a actor or actress that can just, you don't reach everybody. It's more mm-hmm. so like you going you reach everybody, but it ain't gonna be a good reach. Some reach are gonna be like, dang, hold up, whoa, that dang, I wouldn't even, I'm, I'm friendly fire. I love, I, I, I support you. I know I'm white, but I love what you do, Bree. I, I want to stuff like that myself. But it's like, but you shooting them too, but it's like, well, you gotta get shot. I don't know. I can't, I can't, I can't guard the bullet. Like, yeah, cause your cousin probably shot me or your husband probably, you, you probably seen it. You got some people that love what you do, but their husband, what they stand for, is all against everything you stand for. It's like, bro, you can't love mm-hmm. me and, 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 and love that guy because that's, mm-hmm. but guess who? He's the man of the house. Cause what, cause yes, guess what? They kept the white man in your house. So y'all got the two parent boys. So the kids you raising, they, they ain't, they don't got to say my identity is you. So save me on that because who are you really if that's your husband? But that's neither here nor mm-hmm. there. Like that's that maybe mm-hmm. it maybe be breach of that. <laughs> I've had to, I've had to fight sometimes with pieces that I've written, right? So I'll have people like reach out to me like, hey, do a do a piece on this, and I'll write it, and then they'll try to edit it in a way that's like really distorting, <laughs> and I'm like, no, like the choice of words like really matters. Like you're altering what I'm trying to say, you know. So so I mean that's a very real thing, you mm. know. So, uh, last last question, um, before we go to the culture changes. When it's all said and done, when your legacy is, uh, when the, when the book is closed, not to be more, but when the book is closed on, 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 on Brie Newsom Bass and, um, when it's time to go, how would you, how would you like people to, uh, to refer, like, how would you want your legacy to be? I hope, I want people to think of me as staying true. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because again, like a lot of things can, a lot of things can, can change, you know, um, <laughs> especially in this culture. I mean, I, yeah. You know, and I hear, I mean, it's popular today. It may not be popular 10 years from now. I don't know. You know, we kind of went through a period where uh, even black lives matter was not really popular. Like, like this resurgence that we've been having since like the George Floyd killing and everybody be like, Oh yeah, black lives matter. Like it really wasn't like that a year ago. You know what I mean? So You can't, um, and this kind of goes with everything. Like any, you know, if you're going to live a life of integrity and like live on your principles, you can't just like ride the wave of where folks are at on stuff. Like you have to be willing to kind of like stand in that when it's popular and when it's not popular. Um, and so I just hope people, you know, remember me as, as staying true to that. And I'm, I'm certainly trying to do my best to make sure that I stay true to that, um, as well. Mm, Man, that's, uh, that's powerful, man. That's, uh, but that's the only thing about the culture, which I, I'm scary of, that we live in a space where there are certain certain people that are really looking for opportunities to to to, to, to bring down maybe somebody like yourself, like to to just say, okay, nah, to, to throw something out and just very. I think you said that's something scary. Like right now, it may be, hey, we went breed everywhere, everywhere, ever, and then knowing the culture, shoot, you may say something, and then people are like you didn't you didn't got xed out, and it's like, dang, bro, for real, like how you x me out? What up? So if you don't know yourself, you can really start to gauge, especially I can probably as a as a as an activist start to gauge your effectiveness off praise, right? You think? Yeah, you got to be careful about that. You can't. I mean, that that's kind of similar to what I'm talking about with like the celebrity and the fame stuff, like you. You have to be careful because, I mean, I don't agree with everybody. There's nobody that I'm like in 100 (laughs) percent agreement with. And that's okay. You know what I mean? And like I I have to be I have to be okay with like, um, first of all, letting people feel how they want to feel. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Um, But also not not judging like where I stand based on whether everybody approves or agrees with it. You know, and I mean, there's a lot of 
sometimes, honestly, I'm sitting there and I'm like, should I say anything? Maybe I shouldn't say nothing because I'm going to make people mad. Like if I <laughs> say, like, you know, like what I think or I'm just like, you know, I mean, and sometimes I, I don't feel like every opinion has to be shared necessarily all the time or that the time is right for everything. But, you know, I and that's OK. But, you know, I, I again, you can't. If you try to live your life based on approval, you will get lost. I promise you. I promise you. Because people change their opinions. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like people will, people will approve of it today and then flip on you either way. So, so that's just not a way to live, you know? Yeah, man. Love that. So let's go to a rapid fire round. It's five rapid fire questions. Hopefully we get five rapid fire answers. You ready to go? Okay. Cool. Uh, what's the best piece of advice that you have never received? That I have never received? Yeah. <laughs> so this is your top opportunity to just give advice randomly. Oh, gosh. Uh, 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 the top advice that I have never received. I don't know. Top advice. Uh, this is supposed to be rapid fire, isn't it? No, nah, you're, you're good. It always happens. <laughs> Everybody, you're so used to saying, okay, this obviously this advice. But then it's like, hold up. I've never received it, so how can I give it? Like, But it's really just really what advice that you would kind of, you made yourself. Yeah, um, I think it's important to learn how to, how to be, how to live by yourself. Mm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like how to be content with yourself, by yourself is very, very important. Um, like if you want to have good relationships with other people, like, like figuring out how to just be still with yourself and be okay with that. Like nobody's ever really said that to me. That's just something I've kind of had to like learn on my own. Mm. I love that. Um, if you could add one habit and take away one habit, what would they be? Um, if I could take away a habit, um, let's see, away a habit. I'm a low key kind of hoarder. Like I really <laughs> got to be careful. I have to be careful sometimes. Like that I don't, because like I could definitely see that happening. If something <laughs> goes, if something goes crooked. I could definitely like I'll even watch the hoarder show just to remind myself like okay we gotta clean up like don't don't do that um so if I could take that away I, I try to get better at it um throwing stuff out um and if I could add a habit I'm really trying to get more discipline around meditation mm. I'm really trying to to get more discipline around that mm. so if you're meditation people out there you got some tips and tricks man definitely up. Uh... Shoot them on Twitter, man. Shoot, shoot, hit the email, hit the, something like that. So we got, we got a lot of people that probably hit the meditations. So they'll, they'll probably add you and all that good stuff. So that's great. Um, what is your favorite book or movie? Let's do movie because you're a film buff. What are your, <laughs> let's do this. What are your top, top three documentaries? Okay. Top three documentaries. Um, always in season by Jacqueline Olive. Uh, she's actually the executive producer on the documentary I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. um, she did a film about Lynn and Lacey, the boy that was found hanging from a swing set in Bladenboro, North Carolina. Really, really powerful <laughs> documentary. Um, let's see. Um, Heated is this documentary that is about it's by Judith Heflin. It's about um um, environmental justice in Chicago is really crazy. Like certain zip codes in, in Chicago are like a different climate than other zip codes because they don't have trees. Like it, it's crazy. It's a, it's a really good documentary to watch. Um, and let's see, <clears throat> number three, um, Grey Gardens, very random, but, um, but that was a really interesting documentary that was made about, um, these these weird ladies that were like living up in Connecticut and it, it's like significant because it's like one of the first documentaries where they just turn the camera on and they just like they don't do anything except just turn the camera on and just observe people and so that's just like a really interesting uh, one to look at mm. and while we're here this is not in the notes but uh, what would be some some standard books and I don't know why I ask for people that are trying to just understand politics understand black culture they're just trying to get more involved in here what would be some books you recommend or some books, movies, documentaries. Let's go ahead because we have one of the preeminent people in this space that studies a lot. What, 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 what's the starter package? Let's see. Um, I would definitely recommend The New Jim Crow. Uh, that one is is really key in terms of understanding like this modern civil rights movement, especially and like the, how the criminal justice system is used to like keep people from voting. Um, let's see. I would recommend. Um, let me see what I got up here. <laughs> uh, what's really good? 
the autobiography of Malcolm X. Essential, essential reading. Essential. Um, that's, yeah, that's and essential. And you probably have to read that like every couple of weeks. I mean, yeah, not every yeah, couple, yeah. Every couple of years real. matter because it's just, it, the, the older you get, the more experience you get, it starts to hit differently. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I would recommend, oh, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation mm. by Kianga Yamada Taylor. That's another one that is really, really good in terms of like bringing you from the history of the struggle to like what's happening right now. Mm. Really, really good. Mm, mm. Okay. I love that. I love that. Um, <clears throat> if you were the president of the United States, what's the first thing you would do? Abolish police. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole podcast in itself, man. There's so many. Ah, that's a lot. That's a lot with it. I'm, I'm looking forward to see, hearing your content in the future that you have planned on your personally, but also too with Black Alliance, et cetera, on certain topics and really so you can really layer it because uh, I think that's really important. So. Um, we'll get, we'll get back on that. So we're, uh, oh, la the last question this round is what's, what's your biggest fear? My biggest fear right now, I just, I want to survive COVID. Like this is a very scary, very scary, um, period. I don't know if you mean like a biggest fear that's just like, like kind of immediate or if you mean like, uh, oh, it's it's Long whatever. term, yeah, no, but it's like, like right now, everything is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just kind of like looking at 2021. Like it, it's a little hard to plan beyond that. Um, in, in my view, you know, I'm just, I'm just praying for everybody right now. There's so much in the, in the world right now, you know? Mm -hmm. And then we're done with that. And this is the last question of the show. Um, and I asked it to every single person that's ever been on the show. Um, if you could change one thing about, society and most specifically our african-american culture what would it be and why i want to of course eliminate white supremacy and colorism you know um because i really feel like that blinds us to uh an ability to really see ourselves like if you really think about it like we have a whole system that is based on discriminating against people based on how they look mm -hmm. like how how shallow is that how shallow is that? And what does that say about our inability to really understand who we are as human beings if we're like assigning humanity to other people like based on their skin color and how they look, you know, like I would I mean, it wouldn't solve all the problems of the world, but I would love to start there. Mm, man, I love it. I love it. I love it. And as we close, um, what new projects and this is the end. We're done. We're done with all the questions, man. It's been a phenomenal, phenomenal, man. Groundbreaking episode. Is there any certain projects that people should be aware of um, that you're currently working on, working on in the future? And here's the context. This episode will probably be one of, it will be one of the first episodes in our season seven. So it will be around like the first part of September. So um, is there anything that people can look forward to as far as what you're working on, as well as how can people reach out and find, any, find more information about you? Yeah, absolutely. So like I, I mentioned, I'm working on this documentary project. It's called They Tried to Bury Us. And I'm, I'm really looking at the city of Charlotte as an example of a city that puts out this image of being progressive, right? Like mm -hmm. we've got diverse leadership and all <laughs> yeah. this kind of stuff, but we still have the same issues like everywhere else. Um, and so I want to examine that and also how people are really everyday people who are impacted by these issues are working together to make the change happen. Like, I want to make that clear for people who, who aren't working on the front line and don't get to see what that work looks like on a daily basis. And um, I'm looking for, you know, support all the time. So, you know, if people want to, to be in contact to learn more about it or how they can support, you can contact me at my website. Renewsome.com. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also on Twitter running my thumbs all the time if you want to know what's on my mind. <laughs> Going in. Um, at Bri right. Um, at Bri Newsome on Twitter. So, yeah, yeah, reach out. And then, uh, and last thing, last thing, last thing. Um, I, I can't believe I, mi I missed it, but this is a question I had to ask. Um, can, I, I don't know how I'm going to ask it, uh, uh, the frame it, because it is, but. How do you, um, what, what is, what do you, where do you find strength the most in your faith? Cause I know you're big on faith. I know you kind of touched on it, but I, I it wouldn't be a podcast without saying, adrenally asking that in regards to your faith in Christ and God. Um, because you're, you're a woman of God. You're in a marriage. You, you, you're, you're a husband to a man of God, but what your faith plays an important role. So I want you to share with your artists, share with this audience, um, how, how big of a role faith plays in your everyday walk. Oh yeah, faith is faith is central. My faith in Jesus Christ is is central. 
um, to my faith walk. And I mentioned, you know, earlier, like when I first really got involved in activism in like 2012, 2013, around that time, I also really kind of had like a renewing of my faith and my spirit during that time too. Like I grew up in the church, but I really kind of had a, a point of like, you know, I've, I've always been like a very ambitious person, mm-hmm. you know, and I, but I just kind of got to this point where I was like, I really want to focus on things that are bigger than me. And, you know, I, I just remember praying and I was like, Lord, you know, you already know, like the things that I want from my life. I want you to make clear to me what you want for my life. You know, um, I, I want to live the life that you want for me. Um, and that's that's really how uh, I walk and that's how I live. You know, I come from a long line of praying black women. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. um, I'm, I've seen the stuff that my grandmother, that my my grandmother came through on her faith, you know, and that. And so I, I look at that and that's what I really lean on. I try to lean on that strength. Mm, man, man, man. So, Bree, you've given us you've been ultra generous, ultra generous with your time today. Uh, you dropped a lot of stuff. You dealt with my 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 schizophrenic interview style, but that's just kind of how I do. I hopefully you enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed it. Um, This is going to be. Really gonna start the the season off on a on a great note, and um, I really appreciate you, sister, for doing um what you do for what you stand for, um, what you have sacrificed. Because even though it's like it's cool, but it's like you're emotionally sacrificed, and you're taking a lot of bullets for a lot of people, right? A lot of people that is unaware, a lot of black unaware of a lot of stuff, and you and your colleagues and your support system around you, whether it be your family, whether it be people in your tribe, etc. So I want to give you flowers, but as well as your whole tribe flowers as well so i know by the time this airs i i will so i'm going to make a donation to the cause and we want to encourage everybody that's listening to to to, to financially support um which what, what would be like the tribe or what, what would be for 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 people that want to support in in certain ways their movement um what would be the best avenue to support financially yeah if you will contact me at my website at com, just reach out and let me know that you that you're trying to to connect and um we can figure out like there's the documentary project which i'm i'm also like providing equipment for the activists who are on the ground so that they can document their own stories uh we've also got the housing work going on so there's a number of things that you can definitely plug in uh and connect and i can let you know damn i know the trouble is a nation um for the first 10 people that really reach out and do something. I got something special for y'all. Just let me know. But um, we really want to, this season, we're focused on activation. We're trying to activate. Listening is cool. Sharing, liking is cool. But I really don't care about no download numbers. I don't care about none of that stuff. I care about people that's taking the message and applying it to their lives. Um, so, yeah, we really want to big on support. So, Bree, um, hey, have a phenomenal day. Um, tell your husband I'll be sending him an email probably sometime later. I know he had a lot going on and whatnot. Um, so, uh, yeah, appreciate you, sis, man. It's been a phenomenal show, and I'm going to let you do your thing. All right? Absolutely. Before we close, I would be remiss if I didn't give a special Minority Trailblazer shout out to our official sponsor, Scotch Porter. And it's crazy, right? Holiday seasons are here already. It feels like it was just January. Now we're blazing to December 25th, the Christmas holiday. And if you are looking for a beard, hair, or face care grooming products, Scotch Porter is the real deal. I use it every day. When my hair looks all gloused up and looking all spectacular, that's Scotch Porter right there, right? And they're having a 50% off collection sale that just kicked off, and it's the perfect time to stock up on your self-care essentials. Things like itchiness, dryness, shredding, which comes to your beard and hair, or blemishes, bacteria, and clogged pores that come from your face. This product is the perfect, I repeat, the perfect solution to help with all that. It's non-toxic and it includes ingredients like kale, protein, white willow bark, biotin, as well as pomegranate enzymes to cleanse, condition, moisturize, and promote growth. So if you're in the market for self-care products, this is the perfect holiday gift. And for a limited time, you can take advantage of the 50% off collection sales. No promo code needed. You just got to visit scotchporter.com to get started. So remember to show them some love. Go grab you a product for your man, uh, for your for your woman. If you got, they got face stuff. They got all that good stuff, man. So shout out to Scotch Porter and thank you for rocking with Minority Trailblazer Nation. And once again, once again, once again, make sure you go check out RecDiv.com. That is a job board specifically for historically black college and university students. 
and companies looking to only recruit from HBCUs. Go to recdev.com today to get started. And y'all thought I forgot? Hey, I know it's season seven, but ain't nothing changed but the numbers in the range. Y'all done bought that. I, I, it is. Ain't G-O-D, yo. <laughs> but remember, 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 I need to do two things and two things only. What? First, leave a five star review. And two, make sure you lead in. Oh, er, 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 er. make sure you changing the freaking culture. Good night. Ooh, we still ain't done. Yo, we got 39 more episodes. Y'all get with it and get lost. Peace.